evening, Marion Pritchard, President Neal, Wallenberg donors and friends. On behalf of the Wallenberg Endowment Committee and the Rackham School of Graduate Studies, I take great pleasure in welcoming you to this event. Once more, it is heartwarming to see so many individuals with familiar faces who come to this lecture year after year, bringing their children, families, and friends to learn about outstanding acts of courage and humanitarianism. Tonight, actually, we have a special addition to the program, and you can already see the plaque in front of this podium, and we'll turn to that a little bit later. Now, to briefly characterize the Wallenberg Project to you tonight, I will draw on two quotations. First, a wise man once said, all that is necessary for, e for the triumph of evil is for enough good people to do nothing. Yes, it was doing nothing, widespread, passivity and apathy that was such a devastating reinforcement of evil during the Holocaust, and it remains a danger at all times. The Wallenberg Project honors individuals who contradict behaviors of passivity and apathy during threatening times. Second, the Jewish people have a legend which says, that there must be 36 truly good people alive at all times for the world to go on. These are people of quiet courage. They come forward in times of great danger. They use their power to defeat evil. And when the battle is over, they disappear. Surely Marion Pritcher, our Wallenberg medalist tonight must be one of those 36 truly good people. As she demonstrated by saving the lives of scores of Jewish children in Holland, she holds a special place in my heart because I was a Jewish child in Holland at that time, and I'm very grateful for the risks she took and the courage with which she acted on behalf of children like me. Luckily, Marion Pritchard did not disappear after the war, and the Wallenberg Selection Committee is delighted to have her with us this evening and also hopes that for continued success in finding each year one of the 36 truly good people. The subject of Marion Pritchard's lecture is one of great importance because it challenges the widely held misconception that Jews walk to the gas chambers like sheep walk to the slaughter. The highly acclaimed film Schindler's List is a recent example of this mode of portrayal of the Jews, depicting them as passive figures lacking in autonomy and self-determination. The reality is that there are many examples of Jewish resistance and Jewish rescue to be recognized and affirmed for a more balanced picture of Holocaust history. And therefore, we greatly value Marion Pritchard's choice of topic. Now, your program lists the previous recipients of this prestigious Wallenberg Medal. And today, I want to add just a little bit of history of this endowment and the related developments. It all started in 1984, when Jamie Catlin, a long-standing member of this university community, planted the seed for this project, prompted by her astute realization that one of the most illustrious alumni of this university, Raoul Wallenberg, had been slighted in recognition and remembrance on this campus. At that time, there was an annual lecture sponsored by the School of Architecture and Urban Planning in honor of Raoul Wallenberg, but this lecture had an architectural rather than a humanitarian focus. 
It was Jamie Catlin who challenged a group of colleagues, including myself, to work on developing an endowment. About five years later, the Wallenberg Lecture and Medal presentation was inaugurated. We are fortunate to have Jamie with us this evening. Please join me in thanking her for her dedication, her inspiration, and her initiative in this endeavor. Jamie. Since the birth of our annual Wallenberg event, this campus has seen a multiplication of Wallenberg memorials. In 1994, a Holocaust memorial sculpture by Leonard Baskin was installed right next to this building, the Rackham Graduate School on that side, and it has a plaque which honors Raoul Wallenberg. Also, a stunning Wallenberg sculpture by the eminent University of Michigan sculptor John Rush was placed in front of the School of Art and Architecture in 1995. And today, a Ra Raoul Wallenberg memorial plaque developed by the Ann Arbor Historical Society, no, Historical Foundation, will be presented to the president for installation in Lorch Hall which is the building where the School of Architecture was housed formerly and the building where Wallenberg studied on this campus in the 1930s. In sum, the Wallenberg legacy has now a true and visible presence on the campus to help us remember, honor, and learn from this outstanding World War II hero. Each year on this occasion, we pay tribute, validate, and reaffirm the courageous deeds and heroic leadership of Raoul Wallenberg. We do this in three ways. First, a medal is awarded to a humanitarian of international stature whose work reflects the spirit and the essence of the Wallenberg legacy, and today this is Marion Pritchard. A lecture is, is delivered by the medalist, that's the second part, and the third part is that the Wallenberg story is retold each year as a bridge to the medalist whose own humanitarian contributions are receiving recognition. I will now tell the Wallenberg story. Raoul Wallenberg was born in 1912 into one of Sweden's most highly placed families, whose members included diplomats, bankers, bishops, artists, and also professors. For valid reasons, Wallenberg's relatives chose this university as the most suitable American institution for Raoul's advanced education. From 1931 to 1935, he studied on this campus where he completed an undergraduate degree in architecture, which he earned with honors. After graduation, Wallenberg returned to Sweden and embarked on a career in banking and finance, which led him to work in different parts of the world. In the late 1930s, including South Africa, Palestine, and various European countries. His first exposure to Nazi atrocities committed against the Jews took place in Haifa, where while in employment with a bank, he witnessed the arrival of large groups of Jewish refugees forced to leave their native countries. A few years later, he became junior partner in a Hungarian, to a Hungarian Jew in a European trading company and this new position required frequent travel within Europe. At that time, he, was, he encountered many uprooted Jewish families. These wartime experiences, combined with his citizenship of a neutral country, his family background, and other personal attributes qualified Wallenberg to be appointed as a Swedish diplomat, 
diplomat in 1944 with a very special assignment, namely to protect from execution the only substantial Jewish population still alive in Europe, the Jews in Budapest. During a brief six months in Budapest, from July of 1944 to January 1945, Wallenberg made his mark on history. Here he rescued tens of thousands of Jews from Nazi execution with boldness, defiance, persistence, and enormous courage. Clearly, he embraced his mission with utmost dedication and vigor. The tactics which he developed, including false protective passports called Schutzpässe and the safe houses, which were shelters for Jews that were declared Swedish property, were innovative and daring. And moreover, Wallenberg is said to have performed his rescue operation almost single-handedly, thus providing a supreme example that no matter how formidable the odds, one person can make a difference. Wallenberg demonstrated over 50 years something that is every bit as applicable today. One person can make a difference in the struggle for a better world. And this is why the Wallenberg story is to be celebrated and perpetuated on this campus each year. It symbolizes defiance in exposing tyranny, fortitude in defense of justice and human dignity, courage in the midst of a world that was trembling in fear, and steadfastness when virtually everyone was apathetic and silent. It gives us gratification to think that during Wallenberg's formative years, uh, doing his undergraduate studies on this campus, that this university helped to shape the foundation for the monumental acts which followed. Thus, our celebration of Wallenberg, his heroism on this campus, is intended as a lasting inspiration to each of us that we too can be that one person who makes a difference in building a better and more just world. And that's the Wallenberg story. So now at this point, we will turn to the, the part of the program, which is the um, new plaque uh, developed by the Ann Arbor Historical Foundation. And I take um, pleasure in introducing Ms. Terry Bartholomew, who is the president of the Ann Arbor Historical Foundation. Thank you, Professor Butter, and uh, distinguished guests and friends. It's a pleasure for me to represent the Ann Arbor Historical Foundation at this significant event. And uh, we welcome uh, the opportunity to be able to make a presentation uh, of a special foundation project this evening. And of course, you see at the podium here it before you. I would like to tell you briefly about the foundation and its work. It was established 27 years ago in 1969 by a group of Ann Arbor citizens led by Richard Frank, Paul Kempf, Kingsbury Marzov, James Reeker, Raymond Spokes, and Margaret Towsley. It is a private nonprofit organization with a mission to preserve and promote knowledge of local history, its values and traditions, events, artifacts, and sites, and to provide financial support by raising funds or acting as a funding conduit for appropriate projects. These projects are initiated by the foundation, by other groups, or by individuals. Among the, uh, some of the past uh, foundation projects have been assistance to Cobblestone Farm, 
to St. Andrew's Episcopal Church for window repair and restoration, restoration of the Kempfhaus Steinway, and uh, that, by the way, was the first concert grand in Ann Arbor and was used by local uh, and visiting artists. Uh, support for a city historian and the underwriting of various publications such as the Downtown Design Guidelines and the book Historic uh, Buildings, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Current projects include a revised and expanded edition of the Historic Buildings book with a companion map, contribution to the Courthouse Square exhibit, which is part of the new Downtown Historic Street Exhibit program, restoration of the 1915's Wordling Furs mural, and ongoing preservation of the first Y building facade. The creation of the memorial plaque honoring Raoul Wallenberg was initiated, financed, and carried out by the foundation and with the cooperation of the University of Michigan. It is the purpose of the foundation uh, to recall Mr. Wallenberg's residency in Ann Arbor during his student days and to designate the site where he took his classes in architecture. Uh, in the future, uh, as you know, uh, when the date is determined, uh, the plaque will be permanently installed in the lobby of Lorch Hall on main campus. Uh, we invite you to join us uh, for that commemoration. Now I would like to turn the proceedings over to Mr. David Pollock, who has been instrumental in carrying out this foundation project. Mr. Pollock. President Neal, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It is a privilege, as we have already stated, to be a part of the Wallenberg program, and we thank the uh, committee particularly for the uh, invitation to be here this evening. Ruel Wallenberg was a very fortunate young man. He had a grandfather who cared about him and took his responsibility of guiding him in finding a direction in life. Wallenberg's father had died prior to Rule's uh, birth. So Gustav Wallenberg, the grandfather, felt the responsibility of guiding his grandson. Now Gustav Wallenberg was an ambassador in the uh, Swedish diplomatic service. And he had visited the United States as a young man, and he found that this country's vitality and freedom were very valuable in giving him a com completely different insight into the world than what he would have gotten in a standard education in, Swiss in Sweden. And he wanted this for rule. He felt that the Eastern colleges in the United States were too elite and that he would find as what we would call the real America in the Midwest. Parenthetically, I might say he was a very wise man. <laughs> he settled on the University of Michigan on the recommendation of Carl Millis, a friend and a sculptor at that time in residence at Cranbrook Academy in Bloomfield Hills. And one of Carl Millis's fountains is in the plaza just outside this building. The, uh, we are fortunate that the grandfather and the grandson carried on a very extensive correspondence and that correspondence, fortunately, has been preserved and has been published. So Rule came to the University of Michigan in the fall of 1931. He lived in various rooming houses, but particularly at 1021 Hill Street. He took breakfast at the Michigan Union. He read the New York Times every day, 
to keep up on international affairs, and he was a good student, frequently at the top of his class. He generally had good grades, except in math, chemistry, and physics. <laughs> he liked the more creative courses, and Professor uh, Jean Paul Slusser later described him as one of his finest students. Rule was popular with his classmates, his circle of friends, Fred Graham, Dick Robinson, Fred Brazier, Alan Foss, Pete Petrie, and Harold Beecher would gather around his drawing table and discuss problems. He traveled to Mexico with one of the, his classmates in, this, in one summer in an old Ford truck. Rule, however, adopted the familiar collegiate mode of transportation for that era, hitchhiking. One summer, he th thumbed his way to California and back without spending a penny on transportation. In the summer of 1933, he worked for a time at the Chicago World's Fair in the Swedish Pavilion. Hitchhiking back from there one, one day, he got a ride with four men in a car with an Iowa license plate that was headed east. And they had no suitcases, and he thought this was rather strange. And his concern was confirmed when they turned off the highway onto a country road. There they made him get out of the car. They took all of his cash and the money that he had earned at the fair. And as they were doing it, one of the men held a pistol on him. But he was a spunky guy. He insisted that they take him back to the main highway so he could catch another ride, which they did. They threw him out of the car and dropped him in the, in the ditch with his suitcases, but he got back to the main highway. In spite of this experience, he continued to hitchhike and wrote to his grandfather that hitchhiking gave him training in diplomacy and tact. On another occasion, he must have sent his mother a photograph of his room because in a letter to her, he said, uh, the, uh, that his room, you complain in your letter about the things under my bed. You should have seen all the stuff I had piled behind the camera. He later painted two large murals on paper and hung them in his room on uh, Hill Street. He loved the United States. He found New York exciting. Chicago was interesting to him. And he felt California, once you got across those hot, hot deserts, was paradise. He loved Ann Arbor, its people, the classes, and in particular, the annual Messiah concert, which he attended every year. And he said, it is a wonderful piece of music. I don't think that there is anything I would like to hear better than the Messiah. And in 1943, he wrote, I feel so at home in my little Ann Arbor that I'm beginning to sink deep roots and have hard time imagining leaving it, but I am not doing anything very useful here. Soon thereafter, he graduated in 1935, a bachelor's degree in architecture. The, excuse me, this is the last page. Following that, Rule received a letter from Emil Lorch, the dean of the School of Architecture, in which he said, each year we award a medal 
on behalf of the American Institute of Architecture to a student who has, in our judgment, distinguished himself in the work of the school. I am happy to write to you that the faculty selected you as the recipient this year. I congratulate you on behalf of the faculty. Sincerely, E. Lorch. I am sure that grandfather was pleased. Now it is my pleasure to present the Honorable Ingrid Sheldon, Mayor of the City of Ann Arbor, and a member of the Board of Directors of the Ann Arbor Historical Foundation. Mayor Sheldon. Mrs. Pritchard, all the distinguished guests here on the uh, DS, and uh, really a great community that's come forward to want to learn more, understand more about world happenings and about the people that cre um, made changes in really all our lives. I am of uh, Swedish descent, so of course it's even a greater thrill for me to be here to uh, recognize, along with the H Ann Arbor Historical Foundation, one of the great citizens of Ann Arbor, to be been able to say that this famous gentleman passed through our community, touched our lives in some way, and then went on and shared his uh, love for humanity in even greater ways. When Cliff and I were, my husband and I, were able to go to Europe uh, for the very first time a couple of years ago, we had a uh, side trip to Budapest. And so we were able to search out another memorial, another testimony uh, to the, recognizing the contributions of this humanitarian that is located in that city. So we traveled through some subways and on some little uh, trains and funiculars or funiculars, and, but we found it. And it was really quite exciting because I knew of the project from the Historical Foundation and to be able to connect it across the ocean was even more exciting for me. I do want to take time to read what many of you uh, can, can just see. I know it's in your program, but it is very special for uh, us as a community to recognize this famous individual, to be able to share this with the University of Michigan and have it posted for all to see. Royal Wallenberg, 35, student, architect, diplomat, humanitarian, martyr. When Raoul Wallenberg passed through the corridors of Lorch Hall as a young Swedish student of architecture in the early 1930s, there was no suggestion of the heroic role he was to play in World War II. Gifted and popular with his classmates, he earned a bachelor's degree in architecture in 1935. During World War II, as a diplomat in the Swedish embassy in Budapest, Hungary, Wallenberg issued protective passes to thousands of Jews, enabling them to escape the Nazi Holocaust. He was imprisoned by Soviet troops when they captured Budapest in 1945. It is believed Raoul Wallenberg died in a Russian prison, date unknown. With this, I'd like to present this to President Homer Neal. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mayor Sheldon. Uh, it is with deep appreciation uh, that uh, I accept the plaque on behalf of the university and we look forward uh, to the official uh, hanging of the uh, plaque in Lord, Lord Hall so that it will be there uh, to be seen uh, by future generations of students and faculty and uh, members of the Ann Arbor community as well as guests to our town. On behalf of the regents and members of the university community, I am very honored to introduce this year's Wallenberg Lecturer and winner, winner of the Wallenberg Medal. Uh, and that is Marianne Van Binsbergen Pritchard, a woman of uh, great compassion and great courage. Born in the Netherlands in 1920, uh, Ms. Pritchard was enrolled at the School of Social Work in Amsterdam when the Nazis occupied Holland in 1940. 
She became a rescuer in 1942 when, while working at a, a rehabilitation center, she agreed to care for a Jewish infant. Uh, the two-year-old stayed several months with uh, Ms. Pritchard and her family until a safer place could be found outside of Amsterdam. Through the end of World War II, Ms. Pritchard continued to hide and care for uh, Jews seeking refuge from the Nazis, helping to save the lives of at least 150 people, most of whom were children. Following the war, Ms. Pritchard worked at uh, displaced persons camps, which were organized by the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration in U.S. occupied in the, in the U.S. occupied zone in Germany. It was there that she met and married Tony Pritchard, who had been an officer in the U.S. Army and who was also working at the uh, camps. And a few moments ago, I, I learned uh, that there was another connection uh, that, uh, that he attended school at uh, the University of Michigan uh, uh, several decades ago. After the Pritchards came to the United States in 1947, Ms. Pritchard, who was fluent in Yiddish, worked at the Jewish Family and Child Service in Boston helping refugees adjust to their new home. For many years, she has practiced social work and psychotherapy, focusing on the well-being of children. Today, Ms. Pritchard co-directs the Institute for the Study of Violence at the Boston Graduate School of Psychoanalysis. Now, she has received numerous honors and awards uh, from uh, Yad Vashem, Anti-Defamation League and, and Hadassah, as well as from other religious and secular organizations. She was made an honorary citizen of the State of Israel in 1991 and, and has been featured in several documentaries, including The Courage to Care, The Face of Evil, and Every Man. Well, I want to thank you, Ms. Pritchard, for accepting our invitation. I wonder if I could uh, have you to come forward. Uh, we would like to bestow upon you a Wallenberg Medal. And I will try to take it out of the box here. Here we go. I was told that even a physicist could open this. <laughs> here it is. And I guess. We are being asked to stand over here so some photographs can be, uh, be taken. turn the podium over to Ms. Pritchett, if I can get uh, my papers out of the way here. President Neal, Mayor Sheldon, members of the Wallenberg Committee, faculty, students, and other honored guests, I am very appreciative of this honor which you have bestowed on me tonight. I accept it with gratitude, not just for myself, but for many others, without whose help I could not have accomplished very much. They include Dutch Gentiles, two German soldiers, but most importantly, a number of Jews. Conventional wisdom has, divi has divided the players in the grievous tragedy known as the Holocaust into three groups perpetrators, victims, and bystanders. A fourth dimension was added in 1953 when the Israeli Knesset passed the Martyrs and Heroes Remembrance Law, which outlined the functions of Yad Vashem 
and provided a definition of the righteous among the nations of the world. Those people considered worthy of the title are defined as the high-minded Gentiles who risk their lives to save Jews during the Holocaust. Recognized rescuers are designated after a lengthy and meticulous investigation. But Yad Vashem, dedicated to memorializing and teaching the Holocaust, does not honor the Jewish heroes and rescuers, the Jewish righteous, if you will. It is the philosophy of Yad Vashem that Jews who rescued other Jews were merely doing their duty while Gentiles who rescued Jews were doing something special. Not recognizing the moral courage, the heroism of the Jewish rescuers, who if caught were at much higher risk of the most punitive retaliation than we were, is a distortion of history, a distortion that should not be continued. It also contributes to the widespread fallacious notion that the Jews were cowards who allowed themselves to be led like lambs to slaughter. Nothing is farther from the truth. Resistance in the Netherlands got off to a very slow start. Small countries, Switzerland, the Netherlands, Israel, seemed to have the largest number of political parties. And I believe that there were about 50 different political parties in Holland when the war started. And in the beginning, Dutch resistance groups were organized along party lines. Many Jews in this highly integrated country identified themselves fully with the general Dutch struggle and tried to join. <clears throat> Some resistance organizations refused to admit Jews who were systematically being tracked down by the Nazis and who were seen as a potential danger to the Dutch resistance movement and its operations. Some young historians, both in Europe and in the United States, see this as evidence of Dutch anti-Semitism. I know that there was anti-Semitism in the Netherlands, <clears throat> but I think that the resistance groups were trying to protect the Jews. <coughs> Rescuing Jews was never a priority with the Dutch resistance. When they finally got themselves organized and the eight existing resistance groups were merged into one, it was 1943. And by that time, <clears throat> all the Jews were in Vesterburg, the Dutch transit camp, had been deported, were in hiding or passing as Gentiles. The first militant resistance group was organized by Jews, the Society for the Defense of the cultural and social rights of Jews. This unique far-sighted organization, thank you, I hope Bill Clinton isn't hoarse tonight. <laughs> this organization had been founded in Amsterdam in 1939. Their purpose was to teach Jewish youth particularly young Jewish workers, how to defend themselves in the inevitable struggle against the Nazis. It strove to raise the morale of the Jewish population as a whole, and even tried, without success, to supply them with arms. And one of the noblest episodes is the story of the so-called Palestine pioneers and their non-Jewish helpers. Among this group, one name stands out, that of Joachim, nicknamed Shushu, Simon. With a few non-Jewish friends, he devised a bold plan for shepherding 48 pioneers at a time from their training camps across the Belgian border. In January of 1943, when he crossed the border for the third time, he fell into the hands of the enemy, and realizing that he knew too much and that the Germans had a way of making the bravest people talk, he committed suicide. His work was carried on by a Gentile friend who also laid down his life, a man called Joop Westerveel. This socialist teacher and conscientious objector had become very impressed 
with the dedication of the Palestine pioneers and decided to help Simon's comrades across the border. He was seized on March 11, 1944, was viciously tortured and executed on August 11, having admitted nothing and betrayed no one. Karel Pons was a gay Jewish ballet dancer. As a ballet fan from the time I was six years old, I had known Carol, who was one of the teachers at the ballet school I, I uh, attended. I found him a hiding place with a Christian woman painter. It was custom, customary for the underdarker, that means diver, it means the person in hiding, to share a bed with a member of the host family. The Nazis often searched for their victims at night during the curfew. If they found five beds, for instance, in a house that had been slept in, and there were only four people present, obviously the diver was hiding in a closet or cellar and could probably easily be found. Carol came to me after a few weeks and said, Marion, I think I'd rather go to a concentration camp. We didn't know much about the concentration camps yet then, but he said I would rather go to a concentration camp because she's trying to make a straight man out of me and I just can't hack it. <laughs> so we got him a false identity card and dyed his hair. And then we moved him into the garden house of the villa next to the house where I was hiding a Jewish graduate student and his three small children. One night, a Dutch Nazi policeman led three Nazi officers to our house. They didn't find the hiding place under the boards, floorboards of the living room and left. But an hour later, after I had let the children out, the policeman came back alone, and I felt that I had no choice but to shoot him. I don't remember how Carol appeared on the scene. Did five-year-old Lex go and get him? Had he possibly heard the shot? I don't remember, but there he was. In spite of the curfew, he walked to the village and talked with the baker, who was a member of the resistance, and who in normal times delivered his wares in a wagon uh, uh, drawn by a horse. The baker agreed to come and get the body as soon as curfew was over. Carol and the baker together went to see the local undertaker, and the undertaker agreed to bury the body in the coffin of somebody who was being buried the following day. I don't know whether they told the family that there were two bodies in the coffin. I just hope they approved. On another occasion, Carol and I were able to save a two-year-old. The people involved in this adventure were Lintje Brilleslijper, the daughter of a tightly knit, vibrant Jewish family of circus artists, small businessmen, and musicians. Her Aryan common law husband, a German, and her daughter, Katinka. Lintje and Piet, the name by which Eberhard Rebling was known during the war, had decided early on that not only were they going to survive personally, but they would assist as many others as they could in the process. They invited all Lintje's Jewish relatives, her parents, her sister Jani, with her husband and two small children and her brother to join them in a house that they managed to rent about two miles from the house where I was living with Freddie and the three children. They also vowed to concentrate on keeping Jewish culture and religion and tradition alive through their work as artists. Lintje was a dancer and a singer. Pete was a musician. Another 15 to 25 Jews were brought or came to the house at various times. They were warned repeatedly that they were taking too many chances. The local drugstore owner, a man called Bert Bockover, told Lintje that he knew she was hiding Jews because she was buying too much toilet paper. This drugstore owner was hiding Jews himself. But their response was always the same. How can we turn down anybody who comes to us for shelter? On the 12th of July, they were having breakfast when the house was surrounded by police and SS. The house was searched for other inhabitants, 
while an officer called Punt remained in the room to guard Lintje, Pete, Jarni, and the three toddlers. While he questioned them, at this point still quite calmly, Lintje whispered to Katinka not to be scared, and then she threw a very convincing fit. Her whole body bounced up and down on the floor. She rolled her eyes, managed to foam at the mouth, and screamed, just don't take the children. Whatever you do, don't take the children. Clearly taken aback, Pant asked, what should we do with them? Yanni answered, take them to the physicians in the village. They know them, they'll take care of them. While Pant thought this over, Lintje threw another, even more convincing fit, and Pant hastily agreed. Two policemen took the children to the homes of the doctors, who had to swear that they would only release the children to the Nazi authorities. The adults were taken to Amsterdam, where they spent the, the night in prison, and were taken to Gestapo headquarters during the day for questioning. Lintje steadfastly refused to provide any information, and Lagos, a notorious, highly placed SD officer, hit her in the face with his whip and screamed, I know how to make you sing, little bird. I am going to order your child to be brought here, and when you see what we do to her, you will tell us what we want to know. Lintje was later to write in her autobiography, I don't know what I would have done if Katinka had been confronted with me. That night was the last night Peter Lintje shared a cell in the prison. Lintje was deported first to the uh, transit camp Westerbork and from there to Auschwitz. Piet was taken back for more interrogation in a van with his sister-in-law, Janni. At one point, the van stopped and the, one of the guards said he had to do an errand, but he'd be right back. Janni threw Piet a meaningful look and began to flirt with the remaining guard. Piet took advantage of the distraction, jumped off the van, and managed to reach the house of friends in the center of Amsterdam. From there, he called a friend in the village and pleaded with him to remove Tinka from the doctor's care. Carol was visiting with us the following, uh, that night when uh, this friend came and asked me if I would try to kidnap Katinka the next morning. He and some other people in the village had attempted to remove her from the doctor and his family, but failed. The doctor invoked his Christian oath and the only re result had been that a police guard had been assigned to the house. Carol announced immediately that he was coming too. I didn't want him to. If we failed, I would probably be in trouble, but there is no doubt what Carol's fate would have been, either immediate death or a concentration camp. But he insisted, and at 8.30 the next morning, we went to the village. Since I was quite familiar with the house, we agreed that I would go inside and try and find Tinka, while Carol would distract whomever he had to deal with at the front door. I found the doctor's wife and all the children in the bathroom. Fortunately, Tinka was already dressed. I grabbed her, ran down the stairs, put her on the back of my bike, and pedaled off. And it seemed as though she knew how high the stakes were. She was so, so small, so scared, and so brave. She didn't utter a sound. And of course, we did not I did not want to be conspicuous. In the meanwhile, Carol at the front door had encountered the doctor and the guard and kept them occupied for as long as it took me to get away. Without Carol's knowledge and without Carol's courage and Carol's ingenuity, Tinka would have been arrested half an hour later. That's when the Gestapo appeared. They were enraged that their small victim had escaped and they arrested the doctor. They also put up FBI-like posters all over the village, offering a reward for information leading to the capture of Katinka Anita Bosch. Date of birth, August 8, 1941. The doctor was released the next day. After many traumatic experiences, especially for Lintje, who was in Auschwitz and Bergen-Belsen, uh, after the war, she, Pete, and Katinka were reunited. They had another daughter after the war, 
and Lintje carried out her plan to perform Yiddish songs of celebration, defiance, and remembrance for the next 50 years. She involved her husband and both daughters in a three-week tour of the United States, the Northeastern United States, in 1986. She had changed her name to Lynn Yaldati. She died three years ago. Her husband is still alive and resides in East Berlin, as does Katinka, who became a violinist. Uh, Katinka attended the uh, first worldwide conference of hidden children um, in New York in 1991, 1992, I think it was. Another story of Jewish heroism, um, where the scene is the Hollandse Schouwburg, or the Dutch theater, which in the fall of 1942 became the collection point, the first stop on the hellish way to, to the death camps for those Jewish families who had refused to report when ordered to do so. They had been dragged out of their houses at night. The facilities of this small theater were woefully inadequate for the large numbers of people who were forced to spend 24 hours a day there for days, sometimes weeks on end. The Germans decided to reduce the chaos by placing all the children under 12 in the daycare center directly across the street. They were to be reunited when their parents, when they were ready to be shipped to the transit camp. The theater was run by Walter Suskind, an employee of the Jewish committee under the constantly present supervision of the SS and the Jewish committee. Walter Suskind was a German Jew who had, uh, no, well, I'm sorry. Walter Suskind was a German Jew who had come to Holland before the war. In cooperation with Felix Halberstadt, a Dutch Jewish committee employee, and Henrietta Henriques Pimentel, the director of the daycare center, he conceived and carried out a plan that was to save the lives of between 600 to 1,000 Jewish children. How did they manage? Upon arrival at the theater, everyone was registered. Suskind and Halberstadt tried in every way they could think of not to register the children or to have their registration cards disappear from the files. They instructed Sini Kottenberg, a 19-year-old daycare worker who usually took the children from the theater to the daycare center, to ask the parents if they were willing to give up their children and have them placed in foster homes. That was all she could tell them. And uh, you can imagine what a horrendous decision that was for the parents to have to make. The director, Henrietta Pimentel, organized their disappearance from the center. Babies and young children were fetched and taken away by girls, mostly students. Older children disappeared from the lines in which they were taken for walks in the neighborhood. When SS Hauptsturmführer aus der Fünten would become suspicious, Suskind would take him into the living room of the daycare center and ply him with Dutch gin till he passed out. It was probably a fortunate coincidence that Walter Suskind, the Jew, who was playing a real double agent role, and aus der Fünten, the SS men, had gone to high school together in Berlin before the war. The old boy network works in mysterious ways. Walter Suskind was not able to save his own four-year-old daughter. He and his family died in Auschwitz. I knew nothing about this organization until years after the war, though I had participated in their activities. It was a crucial aspect of rescue that the less you knew, the better. What you don't know, you can't tell when you're being interrogated. And having spent some time in jail early in the war, I had some idea of what they were capable of. A friend of mine who did belong to the organization called me one night and asked me if I would take a trip up to the north the next day. She had a high fever and couldn't go herself. All she told me was where to go and pick up a package to take to the north. At the designated place, which was behind the daycare center, I was handed the package, a baby girl. 
we got on the streetcar to the central station and took a train to the north, a trip which normally took two hours. Uh, now lasted all day due to some desultory bombing and failure of equipment, and the baby and I were both exhausted when we arrived at our destination. There, an unpleasant surprise awaited us. The, a man told me that the family I was looking for had been betrayed and taken away. He clearly felt that he, has done his, that he had done his duty by giving me his message, but we must have looked pretty pathetic because he suggested that I, could, that I could go home with him and rest before going back to Amsterdam. Maybe his wife could find the baby some milk. He led us to his very modest home. His wife was there and four or five children. I fell asleep in a chair. When I woke up, his wife had changed and fed the baby, and she was telling her own children that I was a sinner, that I had had this baby out of wedlock, which you didn't do in those days, and that my punishment was going to be that they were going to keep the baby and I would never be allowed to see it again. When he walked me back to the station, her husband apologized for saying these awful things about me, but explained what I had, of course, already understood, that the story would be perfectly credible when people asked who this new baby was and where did it come from. When you think about resistance, you, one usually thinks about uh, guns and rifles and fighting and shooting. Uh, resistance, I want to tell you about an act of Jewish resistance that was certainly different. I had forgotten until a few years ago about a young woman named Esther. I forgot about her until during the so-called Gulf War a friend of mine told me of the birth of a grandchild in Israel. This baby was born in a cellar during the blackout with Scud missiles flying overhead and with the people in attendance wearing gas masks and towels soaked in bleach stuffed in the door cracks. Ida's account of that delivery caused me to remember another delivery, an act of resistance performed under somewhat similar circumstances. Esther was a 16-year-old girl for whom I had arranged a hiding place. It was a very trying situation for this teenager who had to stay in a small windowless room in the upstairs of the house of a middle-aged couple who ran a small clock and watch repair business downstairs. They were very frightened and almost totally ignored her presence. I tried to visit regularly, but couldn't go nearly as often as, as I wished I could have. Early in 1944, she told me that she had figured out a way to defeat Hitler's goal of making all of Europe Judenrein. She told me that she wanted to have a baby. She was quite convinced that she would not survive, but she wanted to leave the world a Jewish baby. She was disappointed at my complete lack of enthusiasm for this project, which was obviously fraught with all kinds of hazards. But she had solutions and answers for every uh, question I raised. She gave me the name and the address of gentle, Gentile friends of her parents and told me that I should go and see them, tell them of her plan, and ask them to take the baby when it was born and take care of it until after the war when they should place it wherever in the world there still might be a Jewish Orthodox community. I asked her how she was going to get pregnant. She told me where I could find her boyfriend. Her Jewish boyfriend, incidentally, was passing as a Gentile and helping move younger Jewish children from one uh, home to another. Um, there were some, in fact, many Jewish children in hiding who were moved anywhere from two to 30 times uh, during their, their life in hiding. He agreed with her, and nine months later, her, her son, their son was born in, in the fall of 1944. I think it was, I think they call it in Hebrew, Bashit, that I happened to be there for the delivery. 
Thank God it was an easy, uncomplicated delivery, physically at least. I took the baby to the Gentile couple who had agreed to the plan and to make the best arrangements possible after the war. Esther and her boyfriend were both betrayed, deported, and perished in a death camp, but the baby lived. I am often asked why some people became rescuers while others stood by and still others were perpetrators. In 1984, Elie Wiesel convened a conference at the State Department in Washington, D.C. called Faith in Humankind, which only concerned itself with Gentile rescuers. One of the purpose of the conference, which was attended by approximately 80 rescuers and 700 plus psychologists, sociologists, and educators, was to find out how the rescuers differed from the bystanders. The idea was that if they could discover what it was in the background of the rescuers that made them act as they did, this knowledge could be used by parents and teachers to raise some, a more altruistic generation. This conference generated a considerable body of literature. Psychologist Samuel Oliner, a hidden child himself, has written a book called The Altruistic Personality. Sociologist Nahama Tech, now a professor at the University of Connecticut, was passed as a Gentile child in Poland and was taken care of by anti-Semitic Christian Poles from the time she was 11 till she was 13. She wrote about her personal experience in a book called Dry Tears. And I should say that this is an excellent book to be read in conjunction with Anne Frank, since it documents the experiences of two girls in two different countries. Nahama examines in her book the, um, the Light Pierced the Darkness, uh, the, the whole question of altruism. She has also written a book called In the Lion's Den, and I want to mention that because it, docu it documents the heroism of a 17-year-old Jew who, through his job as an interpreter in Nazi headquarters in Poland, managed to save hundreds of Jewish lives. He overheard what their plans were, and then he would go to the community where, that they were going to arrest and warn the Jews. Of course, eventually, uh, he had to leave and go in hiding in a convent because he became, they suspected him of his activities. Nahama has written another book called Defiance, which is a carefully researched work about the, uh, part, the Jewish partisans in Poland and Russia. This book was published about two years ago. And the major differences between the regular partisans and the Jewish partisans uh, were, is that the regular partisans were intent on killing Nazis and very few women participated in their activities. The only women that they welcomed were the ones who would cook for them and give them sexual favors. The Jewish partisans under the leadership of Bielski did not care as much about killing Nazis as about saving older people and uh, Jewish children, uh, which they did very effectively. Malka Drucker and Gay Block photographed and interviewed 46 rescuers in a book called Rescuers, subtitled Portraits of Moral Courage in the Holocaust. They found motivation as varied as religious conviction, money, thirst for adventure, and ident identification with role models. And last, but far from least, the special circumstances of the rescuer's own history. Being a rescuer in the Netherlands demanded a temporary transformation of previously held value systems. This doesn't happen overnight. Most of us were brought up to tell the truth, to obey the secular law and the Ten Commandments. By 1945, I had stolen, cheated, deceived, and even killed. My own response to the Nazi occupation was, I am sure, the product of my upbringing. I firmly believe that my parents' particular style of child rearing provided my motivation. I was never punished. 
I was encouraged to put all my feelings, negative and positive, into words, and was treated with respect and consideration from the time I was born. And as a result, I treat, grew up treating other people the same way. There are certain periods in our development when learning is easy, comes effortlessly and naturally, whereas when the timing is off, a great deal of time, effort, and energy is required. Take language, for instance. We all learn to talk somewhere between one and three years of age. I had the great good fortune to grow up in a multilingual household. My Dutch father spoke to me in Dutch. My English mother, who didn't learn Dutch for a few years, addressed me in English. The maid spoke German, and I had a French nanny. And as a result, I acquired four languages effortlessly as I learned to talk. And you all know how much time and hard work it takes to learn a foreign language in later life. It has nothing to do with IQ. There were about 200 children in Amsterdam brought up in similarly quadrilingual households, and we all spoke all four languages, and I only know of one child who mixed the languages up. I remember my mother um, telling me about this little boy who, had, uh, when playing in the park, said, Mommy, Mommy, my bully is gefallen in the aqua. <laughs> but I think that the same thing applies to uh, interpersonal relationships. The basics of how to get along with other people are primarily acquired from birth to three years old. Our attitude towards other people is derived from the way we ourselves are treated from conception on. Abusive parents often produce children who, when they grow up, marry and abuse their own children. Altruistic parents imbue their children with their own attitudes by their example 24 hours a day, but I think primarily by the way they treat the child. Alice Miller, a somewhat controversial psychoanalyst, confirms this point of view when she writes, we admire people who oppose the regime in a totalitarian state, and we think that those people have strong moral sense or courage. We may also smile at their naivete and wonder why they don't realize that their words will have no effect and that they will have to pay dearly for their protest. Both those who admire and those who scorn the protesters miss the points. Individuals who refuse to adapt to a totalitarian regime are not doing this out of a sense of duty or naivete, but simply because they cannot help but be true to themselves. Alice Miller sees courage, integrity, and the capacity for love, not as virtues, not as moral categories, but as the consequences of a benign fate, namely the right upbringing. And she sees morality and performance of duty as artificial measures that become necessary when something essential is missing. And that something essential, of course, is the way one is brought up. I, I promised Professor Bennett not to talk for more than 40 minutes. Um, Do I have a little? I, I'd, like to, I'd like to make a couple more comments before I ask you to uh, give me any questions that you have. Um, the, the whole question, it, it is very easy to stereotype, and we tend to stereotype. We think it perpetrators, bystanders, rescuers, and victims. It wasn't that way. There were perpetrators who at times rescued, uh, as for instance, the two German soldiers that saved me once. Um, the bystanders, ranged all the way from, um, th there were bystanders who knew where Jews were hidden, but didn't tell on them. And you got five guilders for reporting if you knew where a Jew was hidden so that they could find him. There were bystanders who uh, didn't have the imagination, uh, which is rather necessary, but if you asked them to help, they did. There was a milkman, there was a farmer nearby the house where I lived with the father and his three children. He brought me a quart of milk every day, 
and at the end of the war, he could have gotten $100 in the black market for a quart of milk. He bought the milk every day. He never told me why. He never asked for payment. He just did it. The father of a, I had a friend whose father had a dry cleaning business and who loaned me women's army uniforms when I needed to be out after curfew. And there, so that the perpetrators ranged all the way from people who just uh, didn't betray people to people who were active when you asked them to. Um, I think I'll ask for questions now. Comments. Lisa Gorbachev and uh, Mrs. Bush spoke at Smith a number of years ago. Mrs. Gorbachev got a great deal of applause and she raised her hands and clapped and told the audience that it was a Russian custom that when an audience had been particularly friendly and uh, attentive, the speaker claps. So. And there's no such thing as a dumb question. Richard mentioned the conference sponsored by Elie Wiesel in 1984, where they tried to find out what kind of um, factors make people courageous or rescuers. And uh, the question is, what did they find out in the conference? Well, I think that it generated a number of the uh, ideas that I mentioned that Oliner has put in his book, uh, that Naham Tech has called about. That, uh, my conclusion is that the motivation of the rescuers was as varied as, as any group's uh, um, motivation. Pardon? No, I, I, I don't think that there was a general report issued with the conference. Um, well, I'm sure that we all hated the Nazis, but the, uh, the motivations were so varied. For instance, there was one woman, a German baroness, who rescued out of spite. That she is described in Drucker and Bloch's book. Um, she was the eighth child in a family, uh, and she was a very difficult delivery for her mother. And as a consequence, her mother hated her and was cruel to her and treated her badly. The mother was also very anti-Semitic and told her not to have anything to do with Jews. So in revenge and to, to uh, protest against her mother, she rescued a number of Jews and married one. So it's an, it's an interesting point because Yad Vashem again excludes the people who, rescue, who took money for being rescuers. And one of the people who was rescued, in fact, he's a psychiatrist here in Michigan. Uh, um, his name is Dr. Tanay, T-A-N-A-Y. Yeah, Emmanuel Tanay. And he, is he? 
where he feels that, um, or yeah, he feels that it doesn't matter whether people took money or not. They rescued, and that was the important thing. Um, they were plain soldiers. Oh, want to repeat the could, question? The question is, could you tell us about the situation when the two SS soldiers saved you? Uh, towards the end of the war, there was a tremendous scarcity of food in the part of the country that was still occupied. And in, in Amsterdam alone, 12,000 people starved to death that winter and it takes an awful long time to starve to death. So people walked to the northeastern part of the country where there, were, where there were farmers and tried to beg, borrow, steal, or trade uh, whatever they could get. We were running out of food at that time. Uh, my mother let me take some of the family silver and I took my flute. I went up and managed to get uh, some supplies. We had bicycles with wooden tires because the Nazis had taken all the rubber tires. Uh, but on the way back, uh, the difficult point was the crossing point of the river Eisel. There was a guardhouse at the beginning of the bridge and you were not allowed to transport food in those days. Um, when, when, we got, when I got near the bridge, it looked as though traffic was passing normally. The, the other thing you could do was rent a boat. There were people who would offer to take you across the river in a boat for a lot of money. But half the time, they were so hungry themselves that they dumped the people out of the boat and kept the, money, kept the food. So I didn't want to try that. We started across the bridge. And um, suddenly another, a German patrol came out and took about 80 of us into the guardhouse and told us that uh, we would be allowed to continue on our way the next morning, but that they were going to keep the food and the baby carriages and the bicycles, whatever we had with us. And at that point, I did something very foolish and very stupid but I lost my temper and told them what I thought about Hitler and the Nazis and the persecution of the Jews. And of course, everybody tried to make me be quiet because uh, people got shot for a lot less than that. So I managed to calm down. We dozed through the night. Five o'clock the next morning, two German soldiers come in and they point at me and they say, house, that means get out. And there was sort of a, <gasps> in the room because everybody thought that was the end of me, and I thought so too. But when I got outside, they put me in the passenger seat uh, of the cab of a truck. They put my bicycle and all the food in the, in the back of the truck. They drove me across the river and wished me well. I may not have answers, but... Um, I had a question. I was wondering if you're in contact with any of the people that you helped out, like right now. Uh, I was wondering, at the moment, are you in contact with anybody that you helped out during the war? Well, the notion that I saved 150 people, which somehow got, is always said, I tried, but I don't know. I'm sure that a number of them did not survive. Um, the, th the three children that I took care of myself, I am in close touch uh, with the youngest one. I hadn't s seen her brother, but just recently, a friend of mine from Newton, who, Bonnie Greenberg, who tells stories about the Holocaust, she knew my version of that particular story. This summer she went to Israel, stopped in Amsterdam on the way back, and talked to Erica. And uh, not only did she talk to Erica, Erica had her brother Tom there, 
and Tom had, until then, not shown much interest in being in touch with me. Um, since that meeting with Bonnie Greenberg, uh, he's faxing me and sending me email every day. In, in fact, um, I got a fax when I was still at home asking me when Bonnie had told him that I was going to be given this award tonight. So he, will, he faxed to me, when is it happening? Erica and I will come. Well, that was day before yesterday, so it was too late. But otherwise, they would have been here. Um, I still see Katinka, the little girl that I kidnapped occasionally. Um, I, I have met one child um, at a meeting like this. Um, but mostly at meetings, I have met people that I knew in the DP camps. Nahama Tech uh, adds what she calls marginality, which has, somehow has a negative valence. But what she means by marginality is that most of the rescuers um, did, did, were not strongly identified with just one group. Uh, for instance, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses are a group, and they do a lot of things together. Uh, most of the uh, rescuers um, didn't have that kind of identification with one group, and that's certainly true for me. I was half English and half Dutch. Um, my parents let me join the Girl Scouts, which was not something that, that, that my friends' parents would allow them to do. Um, we did... <coughs> She says that we do tend to think more independently, but of course that's also a Dutch characteristic. The, the Dutch value independent thinking. The Roman Catholic Church is usually at odds with the Vatican. And when um, Mussert was the leader of the Dutch National Socialist Party, he agreed with the whole Nazi philosophy except the anti-Semitism, and he allowed Jews to join the uh, Dutch National Socialist Party, and about 500 did, and not un until we were invaded by the Nazis uh, were they forced to kick the Jewish members out. I don't know if that, I don't know if that's relevant. It just came to mind. I was in, uh, I first spent 10 months in a camp called Föhrenwald, which was in Wolfratshausen near Munich. Then I went to Kloster Indersdorf, which was a child search ca uh, team for a couple of months. And then I was in a camp called Winsheim, which was near Regensburg in Bavaria. And I'd like to announce two more events um, during uh, Marion Pritchett's visit. The first one is a coffee hour, which is tomorrow morning, and it is sponsored by the um, Rackham Center for the Child and Family, and it'll be taking place in East Hall, 
uh, on the fourth floor tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock from 10 to 11 and it's open to anyone who would like to attend and also there will be a reception tomorrow evening which is sponsored by the uh, Dutch language studies program and the Netherlands University American League and that will be at 8 o'clock in the West Conference Room in this building, Rackham School of Graduate Studies. So uh, please return and um, have um, further dialogue with Marion Pritchard and um, hope some of you can come upstairs and to the reception now. And thank you very much. For